Well, welcome to our living room here at the Mason House. Uh, we just decided to have you all over here for Bible class tonight. Actually, we uh, were instructed to uh, by the situations going on, as you well know, in our world. And so we're making do. Um, but we welcome you here and invite you to a little time of Bible study as we normally would be would be doing on Wednesday night, uh, but at our building. But glad to have you here and um, that we have this kind of ability uh, to broadcast is a, is a, a blessing for a time like this, no doubt. I um, just wanted to encourage you to be keeping, um, keeping track of emails and social media posts that the church is putting out, uh, sort of letting you know what's going on with our assemblies and and. So, so forth in coming days. I um, won't go through those announcements right now. We'll just get into our study, but uh, those are available in other forums. Um, I want to study with you tonight of maybe a passage you haven't looked at or a book. Um, I, if you've listened to me long enough, you know I like to uh, get us into texts uh, maybe that we have not looked at before. Uh, this is an easy book to miss. Uh, that we're going to study from tonight because it's tucked between two other really big important books between uh, the prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Ezekiel. Um, it's easy to miss the little book of Lamentations that, that comes in between there. Um, it's not one that we often turn to, but there is a great message in the book um, that I think maybe be helpful to us this week. So we're going to study in particular from just about the middle passage of, of Lamentations. Um, Lamentations chapter 3, uh, verses 21 through 24. Um, a little background on this book that, to help us understand what's going on here. Um, this book is, as its title suggests, a lament. It is a lament, really, over the fall of the city of Jerusalem, the destruction of the city and all that went along with that. It, uh, the city was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. And sometime later, uh, this poem was written as a lament over that event. Um, Jeremiah was known to be a writer of laments. Um, he, uh, not only the book that, that uh, features his name as the title, the, the, the book of Jeremiah, but also Lamentations is credited him. And uh, as time went on from the destruction of Jerusalem and this book was composed, uh, it was uh, read each year when the nation would commemorate the destruction, the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the nation. Uh, eventually, they had a sort of a festival uh, or a holiday, you might call it, called the Ninth of Av. Av was a month in the Hebrew calendar, and that was the day where they remembered the fall of Jerusalem. And to this day, um, Jews who are observant of these things will read the Book of Lamentations at the festival of the Ninth of Av. Um, so... Um, that became even more important when, uh, in New Testament times, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed uh, in 70 A.D., and so Jews continued to observe and, and read this book, um, both for the 586 B.C. destruction and for the 70 A.D. destruction. One of the interesting things about Lamentations is that it's a big acrostic poem. Uh, you're familiar with acrostics, I'm sure, um, we use them at times, for instance, with the word grace. Um, when we ask, you know, how do you define grace? Some, some will say God's riches at Christ's expense. That's an acrostic where each letter stands for something. It's been done with the word Bible as well. You may have heard the acrostic for Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E. Well, a similar thing is done in the book of Lamentations. 
Um, it's a huge acrostic poem. We have five chapters in Lamentations, and you'll notice that four of the five chapters have 22 verses. That's because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, the language that the book was written in. And so you're getting um, A, B, C, uh, their equivalent in each chapter with each verse. Uh, the middle chapter, the one we're going to study from in particular, chapter 3, has 66 verses, uh, a multiple of 22. So three different times an acrostic is used in chapter 3. Now, this is all in the original language, of course. We don't see it as easily in English. But it tells you something about the book, how important it was. Uh, they used acrostics to help people memorize and um, to um, sort of be very careful in the composition and, and, and to be very complete in the thought. So it's sort of saying, here is the A to Z of our mourning, our lamentation over the destruction of our city, Jerusalem. And uh, so it tells you something about the importance of the book to the people and the original readers of it and those who used it in time to come. Um, lamentations uh, might take a moment and sort of define that word itself, a lament. Um, a lament is, is something that expresses deep sorrow. Uh, it's a mourning. It's, it's a grieving of something. And, and so as you look at Lamentations, as you read it, you'll notice that just about every verse in some way expresses that lament. In fact, all but four verses in Lamentations does just that. It laments, expresses grief and, and sorrow. And it's all about this terrible tragedy of the destruction of their nation and their capital city and their place of worship, uh, the temple. This was a, a complete disaster for the people of God at the time. And, and um, it was something that the prophets had said was coming if they didn't change, if they didn't repent and be more faithful to God. Uh, but they did not heed the warnings, and the Babylonian armies uh, swept in and totally destroyed the city and the temple. And at that time, not only was were the buildings um, destroyed, but also their people were killed and slaughtered, and you know uh, the, the soldiers raped citizens of of Jerusalem. Families were torn apart. People were carried away into captivity. And, and all of it brought on the people by God as a punishment um, for their sin. And that's really focused on in chapter 2, the sins that brought this about. So you have all this description and, and lament of what happened at this time. But right in the middle of the book, in chapter 3, uh, really verses 21 through 24, you have this one bright spot that is not a lament. Um, one writer said it's the peak of the mountain jutting above the clouds. And I think that's a, a, a great way of describing it. Um, you have these verses that I want us to, to think about for a moment tonight. Two great ideas um, unify this book. And really to, to not see one or the other or both of them, really destroys its message. The first one is stated in, in chapter 2 and verse 17, and that is that, that God has kept his promise. Chapter 2, verse 17 says, The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. So God, as we said, had, had said through the prophets, the many prophets, that this was coming if the people didn't change, if they didn't repent. And he has now indeed kept his promise. Their city, their temple has been destroyed. That's one of the great ideas of the book. The second one is that God 
despite all that, remains faithful to his people. And this comes in, in our passage for tonight, chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. God remains faithful to his people. And um, some of this may sound familiar to you. In fact, some of these words we, we often sing, whether we know where they're from or not. Lamentations 3, verse 21, it says this, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Probably a, a lot of that reading you could have quoted as I started reading it because, as I said, we sing that song so often. This is another great idea of the book, and it's right at the heart of the book, right at the middle. Again, that God, despite everything that's happened, remains faithful to his people. And these really point out two important aspects of who God is. Uh, the Bible is about God. He's the center of it. He is the hero of every story. And and um, two important things we learn about God in Lamentations is, number one, he's a God of righteousness. Um, in fact, he will punish sin and rebellion, which he does, uh, as is remembered by this book. So that's important. That's an important part of who God is. But secondly, God is also a God of faithfulness. This means he will keep his promises that he has made to his people. And he can be relied upon, counted upon. And so you have this book that's sort of like 99% negative, mourning, um, it's sad. And then you have this bright spot in the middle. And it's interesting as you look a little bit more closely at, um, at the center of, of chapter 3, you almost wonder how the same person could have written these two different sections. For instance, chapter 3, verse 18, listen, listen to what the writer says here. He says, So I say, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. My endurance has perished, so has my hope. Well, just a few verses later, we have the, the ones we read a moment ago, 21 through 24. Uh, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. How could the same person in the same chapter write those words, write the same words? Uh, that's one of the amazing things about this book. And there's a great answer to that. You know, we sort of are, are like this at times, are we not, where we're going through a difficult time, whatever it might be, maybe a tragedy in our life or some kind of difficulty. And we have days where we think, I have no hope, um, where we're discouraged, and yet we still have faith, hopefully, in, in the God of faithfulness. And so how is it possible that we can do that? How is uh, the person who wrote verse 18 of chapter 3, of Lamentations. How can that be the same person who who wrote verses 21 through 24? Well, a few things um, that are true about it and that maybe can help us as we reflect on the challenging times in, in, in our life. Number one, uh, the writer, uh, he remembered the right things. I think that's really important for us in thinking about this. He remembered the right things. If you look back at verse 21, the beginning of our reading, he says, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. You see, he's, he's, he's remembering certain things. He says, I, I recall this, I call this to mind. So the writer made a decision to remember who God was, despite his circumstances at the moment. Um, and, you know, we do that all the time. We, for instance, we take the Lord's Supper every week uh, on the Lord's Day. So we will remember who God is. 
and what he has done for us. And we recall his goodness to us, his, his past mercies. We recall our conversion, um, becoming believers and, and becoming a follower of Jesus and all the blessings that came with that. And we recall how our lives changed. And so we choose to remember the right things. That's important to do when we're in the midst of challenges. And that's what this writer did in, in Lamentations. A second thing he did was he experienced the love of God. First, he remembered the right things, but then he experienced the love of God. Verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Um, from the writer's perspective, despite everything that had happened, the destruction of his city, uh, the carrying away into captivity, loss of freedom, he was still alive. I mean, he still existed then, and he could reflect on the love of God. Uh, this word, steadfast love, uh, in this translation is sort of analogous to um, the word in the New Testament that I'm sure you've heard about before, uh, the Greek word agape. Um, the steadfast love of the Lord is, is God's loyal love. Uh, again, recalling that he is always loyal to his promises. He, he doesn't forsake what he has promised his people. And that's something that we need to remember, even at times when we might look around us and, and not see it, obviously. Um, this, this man had experienced the love of God, and he remembered it. And this was something that sustained him. There's a great passage uh, back in the law, in, in Exodus chapter 34, where God reveals, you might remember to Moses who he is. He's up on the mountain receiving the law from God. There's this great scene uh, in chapter 34 where God basically gives uh, his resume, who he is. Verses 5 through 7 of, of Exodus 34, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And notice as God describes himself, uh, that he emphasizes these two things we've talked about in this study, that, that God is a God of righteousness. Uh, that means he will punish, uh, but he is also a God of faithfulness and, and mercy and grace. And uh, this description, this self-description of God is repeated over and over throughout the Old Testament in different passages uh, where people want to talk about what God is like. So, our writer, how could he write both these depressing passages and this wonderful, hopeful one right, uh, right in the middle of chapter 3? He remembered the right things. He experienced the love of God. He also experienced the faithfulness of God. Again, verse 23 of our text, um, he had just talked about steadfast love. And, and God's mercies, and he says they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So he recognizes that, that every day um, there are mercies and to be received, and, and the love of God is available to us. And I think there are times when we just need to step back and appreciate the daily mercies of our God. Um, appreciate family. Now, Likely, you're spending a lot more time with them these days, uh, in these few weeks, hopefully, of quarantine and so forth than, than you're used to. And maybe we're being able to be reminded of the mercy of family. We're certainly reminded of the blessing of health in a time like this. And that's something that we can be thankful for every day while we have it. And life itself 
and the fact that we have great hope beyond this life. These are daily mercies of God. And, and then there are those special mercies that he dispenses at times, whether it's healing in response to prayer or, or answers to prayer, um, a blessing uh, in our work, maybe a bonus at work, or, or even just a compliment from someone that comes to us at the right time. Every good thing comes from God, and those are daily mercies he, he, he sheds upon us. So that's an important thing that this writer and we need to remember. Um, we need to experience the faithfulness of God. Now, one other thing I believe in this passage uh, we see in the last verse that we read, verse 24, is uh, you know this, this person realized God was his only choice um, if there were any other God uh, maybe he would turn there uh, but there wasn't God was his only choice uh, notice he says in verse 24 the Lord is my portion says my soul therefore I will hope in him the Lord is my portion uh, God is the only God he is uh, in, in the writer's words, his, his portion. And so he's to be praised that he's a good God, that he's faithful every day. And, and that, that word portion is interesting. It really comes, it's language that comes from, you remember when Israel came into the land, to the promised land, how they divided up the land among the tribes. Each tribe got their portion. Uh, they got their this distribution, their their boundaries in the land. Every tribe among the twelve got their portion except one. Uh, only the tribe of Levi didn't get a portion of land, a, a specific tract of land. But if you go back and read that, God told them, told the Levites, that he would be their portion. All the other tribes got a specific tract of land, a portion but Levi's portion would be God alone. Um, that's sort of our situation. And, and we need to reflect on that and ask, is God our portion? Uh, is he enough for you? Does he satisfy you? Well, sometimes we struggle with that, no doubt. And, and when we do, maybe that's when we, we need to remember this text from, from Lamentation, these steps. Um, how did the writer survive this? Number one, he remembered the right things. Uh, number two, he experienced the love of God. And he experienced, three, the, the faithfulness of God. And he realized that God was his only choice. He, God was truly his portion uh, one of the older commentators on on this book in our brotherhood, uh, Dr. Tony Ash, said that Lamentations is a great call to faith, brighter because of the dark times from which it issued. And so, you know, I almost wonder sometimes why we don't have a lot of poetry or even very many songs in our repertoire of spiritual songs that are lamentations. Uh, there was a time in our world where we had more of those, and maybe now's a time where we should be composing them. Lament is a part of faith. You know, we, we reflect on a difficult situation, uh, a tragedy, and and we, we put into words how it was awful on one hand, but we saw the faithfulness of God on the other. Um, that's what Lamentations is really about at its heart. And, and I don't think it's a book that we should leave behind. I mean, it's there for us for a reason. It's sort of a, a forgotten prayer for us. And it should be a part of our faith in Christ. Maybe we can revive it. I'd encourage you to read it in these days when you perhaps have a little bit more time to read. Again, just five chapters. And um, I'll, I'll warn you, uh, part, a lot of it is depressing, but if it gets too much, just, just remember the heart of the book. 
chapter 3, 21 through 24, that's what sets it all in perspective. And that's what can bolster our faith, I believe. I want to thank you for, uh, for being a part of the study tonight. Uh, why don't we have a word of prayer and, and then we'll close. Holy God, we bow before you. Uh, we're thankful for your love and grace and your mercies every morning. We know they're new to us every day. Help us to always be grateful and then to share your goodness and mercy with others. Thank you for uh, this family that we have in Christ. Um, thank you for the ability to uh, interact even with this modern technology in this time where we're isolated from one another. Please be with us. Please be with those who are struggling physically that might be sick. And we pray that very soon you will remove this, these threats from us and that we'll be able to get back to a normal walk of life. Uh, give us strength until that time. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for the, the depth and riches of your word. Pray that we've handled it in the right way tonight. And thank you for your son who went through the worst for us to save us. Pray in his name. Amen. Glad you could come over tonight. And again, uh, please keep uh, listening for calls, emails, um, other bits of information will be coming from the congregation and let us know if there's some way that we can be of assistance to you. God bless you until the next time we meet.